Hello, everyone. Thanks very much to the BSC for having us. It's a pleasure to be with you today. I'm Lauren Williams, and beside me is my colleague, Ellis Ng. We're both liaison librarians in the Rare Books and Special Collections Department of McGill Library, where I curate the Blackerwood Natural History Collection, among a few others, and where Ellis curates our archival collections, Judaica material, and children's literature collections, among many others as well. We're here to share with you some preliminary steps we've taken to discover and learn about the women printers who exist within our collections. We plan for this uh, research path to lead to a larger project, one that will hopefully result in a digital exhibition or perhaps even a descriptive bibliography of the works produced by these women. But for now, we thought it might be interesting or perhaps even helpful for those in the audience who are asking similar kinds of questions for us to share some details about our search methodologies along with the challenges and successes we've encountered. We've been very happy to witness the growth in interest and in documentation of women printers over the past two decades or so. The appearance of online catalogs and tools like the Women in Book History Bibliography have been an incredible boon to research in this subject area and go a long way toward bringing this, this often overlooked aspect of print history into focus. However, the work of documenting women printers throughout history and all over the world is just getting started. There are so many important names still obscured and so many stories remain untold. In particular, we've noticed the growing body of English language scholarship on women printers in Britain, which is truly fantastic. But as a result, we thought it might be prudent to begin our search within McGill's collections for women printing in other countries and languages. I began my search within the Blacker Wood Natural History Collection for women printing in France, and Ellis decided to look into Yiddish language printers in Eastern Europe. We'll split our presentation into two parts. I'll speak briefly about the process of casting a wide net, using certain search strategies to track down women printers in library catalogs, and we'll share a few interesting details about the lives of the 18th and 19th century French women printers I located. Then Ellis will take us on a deeper dive into one particular printer working in Vilna in the late 19th century. So one of the biggest challenges to grapple with when beginning this kind of project is how to track down the names of the printers you're looking for. Naturally, if you already have a name in mind, a keyword search in a library catalog will bring up a name listed on the imprint of a particular work. But as relatively few names of women printers have been documented, this approach was not particularly helpful in our case. Some catalogers have also fairly recently begun the practice of tagging a work with the subject heading women printers, not only when the work is about women printers, but also when it's been printed by a woman. However, this practice is far from standard, and because it is recent, it doesn't apply to the millions of works catalogued earlier in the 20th century. From the 16th century onward in France, it was legally accepted and relatively common practice for widows to inherit the printing operations of their deceased husbands. Once inherited, their names would often appear on the imprints of works as the widow so-and-so. As such, searching in a library catalog for the word widow in any language brings up a fair number of results. Narrowing it down by a particular named collection makes these results much more manageable to search through. For my purposes, this brought up 11 French names within the Blacker Wood collection for me to investigate further for works printed between 1748 and 1910. I opted to begin with the 18th and early 19th century and five names emerged of the women who appear on imprints from this period. I searched academic article databases for each of their names and didn't turn up any results, which emphasized for me the need to further document the work of these women. A Google search for each of their names turned up little more, with the exception of the authority records of the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. These provide at least a small amount of information about their lives and work, and helped me to distinguish between some of these women who had actually been primarily booksellers, or what, we might, or what might be called publishers in the modern sense, versus those who had managed print shops. While looking into this distinction, I also found some fascinating tidbits of information. La Veuve Duchesne, for example, was such a well-established bookseller slash publisher that her name was often used on false imprints to get around France's strict publishing censors. To get a better sense of the overall output of the printers on this list, I searched for the women's names in WorldCat, an online catalog that pulls search results from institutional libraries worldwide. These searches returned tant tantalizingly high numbers of results, like the 718 for Lava Vagas, but it proved difficult in the public search view to manipulate these results in any useful way. These results have the potential to be a very powerful tool. They could give any researcher a sense of how many different titles a printer has published, how many different editions each title went through, the overall range of years during which a printer was active, the eventual dissemination of their works in libraries throughout the world, and so forth. 
but going through each record individually would be far too time consuming. I tried in vain to figure out a way to export these results to a CSV file so that I would be able to sort and reorder the information, but WorldCat only allows you to save 10 results at a time. McGill has also adopted WorldCat as their library catalog, but this program forces you to manually select and star each individual result. There's no select all option, as I've seen in other library catalogs. Luckily, I was able to ask my colleague in McGill's cataloging department, Megan Chelu, whether her staff view allowed her to export large numbers of search results, and it turned out that she did indeed have this ability. I include this digression into the functionality of WorldCat because it poses a real challenge to all researchers dealing with large search results, as well as to librarians who aren't also catalogers. The search results that my colleague was able to export began to paint an interesting picture of the productivity of these printers. This spreadsheet generated for La Veuve Agasse shows over 400 unique titles ranging from 1813 to 1839. It also shows me that she began printing maps later on in her career and lists all of the various forms of her name that she used in her imprints, which facilitates future searching. Of my initial list of five women printers slash publishers from this time period, two emerged as printers to study, La Veuve Agasse and La Veuve de Jean Martel, who succeeded her husband as the king's printer in Montpellier from 1760 to 69. WorldCat locates 170 results with her name appearing on the imprint, and my sorting of these results shows about 50 unique titles printed during her nine-year career. These works were mainly medical in nature, but in her role as King's printer, she also produced official documents like this collection of edicts and so forth for the year 1769. In the late 17th century, the French royal government, becoming increasingly fearful of the printed word, introduced printing licenses and placed strict limits on the number of printers allowed to operate in each region. When the widow Martel succeeded her husband, she became one of only two printers allowed to operate in Montpellier. These restrictions made it very difficult to obtain a printing license. When a master printer died, his license did not automatically transfer to his sons, nor his wife or daughters. His successors were required to apply to the chancellor or keeper of seals, as well as to the local printing guild to take over the license. Qualifications included having completed an apprenticeship, being a devout Catholic, and having a knowledge of Latin and Greek. Jane McLeod notes that wid widows encountered serious opposition to the inheritance of their husband's presses from the local printing guilds, whose members coveted the few official printing positions for their own sons. With these considerable obstacles, it's all the more impressive that the widow Martel was able to carry on her husband's printing operation and to produce so many works on her two operational presses. By the late 18th century, the French Revolution brought about great changes for the printing and publishing industry. The freedom of the press movement marked the end of the monarchy's licenses, censors, and restrictions on the number of printers allowed to operate in each area. The Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen of 1789 sanctioned the freedom of the press as a natural and inalienable right. While this right initially did not extend to women, the attitude toward women in the book trades seems to have incrementally relaxed over the following decade. By 1793, a typesetting school for women was established in Paris. The apprenticeship lasted six months and cost 400 livres. Its opening was initially met with resistance from male printers, but the school went on to publish a number of works like this one. I imagine it was developments like these that paved the way for the widow Agasse in 1813 to take over what was by then the largest printing operation in Paris. Not only did she inherit 27 presses and over 100 employees, the widow Agasse also took over publication of the largest daily newspaper in France, the Moniteur Universel, along with Charles Joseph Pancouk's ongoing Encyclopédie Méthodique, intended to be a more detailed version of Diderot's Great Encyclopédie. Organized by subject rather than alphabetically as Diderot's was, this venture nearly bankrupted Pancouk. The first volume dedicated to medicine was published in 1787, and by the time the widow Agasse took over the press in 1813, hundreds of volumes written by hundreds of authors with over 6,000 engravings had been published. The widow Agasse managed to finally bring the project to a close in 1832 with the publication of the last 10 volumes dedicated to natural history. These are just a few of the remarkable stories I've come across in the first stage of this project. I hope that in the coming months, both Ellis and I will be able to discover many more women printers in McGill's collections, and we look forward to sharing these with the book history community. I'll turn things over to Ellis now. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you so much, Lauren. And now I will just uh, open up my presentation. 
with me. Hello, uh, thank you again, everybody, for being here. Um, so using uh, similar methods to what Lauren described, I've so far found three widows uh, involved in printing within the Judaica collections at Rare Books and Special Collections. Uh, and today I'm going to be focusing on one of these women, uh, Devorah Rom, or the Widow Rom. And I'll be focusing on her via the Joe Fishstein collection of Yiddish poetry. I'm hoping to use print history as a way of illuminating connections between Devorah Rom and the Bund the Jewish socialist organization that became a dominant force in Russian and Eastern European politics during the early 20th century, and which has a continuing influence on Jewish culture globally. The books I'll introduce were printed after Devorah's death in 1903, and I believe provide a glimpse of her legacy within Vilna and beyond, and an insight into how the Bund was able to achieve its goals. Devorah Harkavi, later Rom, was born in 1831 and settled in Vilna, the capital of present-day Lithuania, by the time she was in her 20s. Her husband, David, managed the printing press run by members of his family since 1799, one of the major drivers of Vilna's establishment as a hub of Jewish cultural life during the 19th century. David's tenure coincided with the reign of Tsar Nicholas I, however, a period that saw anti-Semitism codified into law. Not long before David took over, a new grant granted the government, a new act granted the government expanded powers of censorship and closed every Jewish printing business in the Russian Empire except for two, one of which was the Rom printing press. The pressure was huge and a serious fire didn't help matters. It was in this context that David took the helms. In 1860, David unexpectedly died setting the stage for Devorah to inherit the press and step into the role of the Widow Rom, a name that came to be emblazoned within hundreds upon thousands of books circulated the world over, most especially the Vilna Talmud, a feat of printing involving a team of over 100 people and resulting in a definitive edition still used today. According to the bibliographer Abraham Haberman, only because of the superior intelligence of Devorah Rom was this print shop able to reach unparalleled heights and make in a name eternal for itself. For anyone wanting a full introduction to the Joe Fishstein collection, I highly recommend A Garment Worker's Legacy, Goldie Segal's in-depth research into the collection, its holdings, and Fishstein himself. Given the title of Goldie Segal's work, it's not surprising to learn that Fishstein was an active member of the International Ladies Garments Workers Union and that his collection holds books associated with the Bund, first established in Vilna in 1897 and a movement which from the very start emphasized the importance of literacy and reading as a way of instilling unity amongst Jewish workers. The fact that reading was of paramount importance to the Bund can't be overstated. Its founding members were disparate linguistically and decided that in the interest of uniting Jewish workers, Yiddish had to be its lingua franca. To that end, it focused a huge amount of energy on expanding literacy and access to Yiddish literature. Die Welt, meaning the world, was established as the Bund's official publishing arm in the period just before the First World War. In her study, Suzanne Martin Finnis notes that the Bundist press profited from the strong traditions in Jewish printing. Although the Rom press became one of many after the relaxing of some of the laws that I mentioned earlier, its earlier stability and longevity were unique within the Russian Empire, and I believe form an important part of the strong tradition that Finnis mentions. Authorship, reading habits, and publishing, as distinct from printing, feature heavily in histories of the Bund. What I'd like to do is stay within those confines of Bundist history, but to shift the focus more squarely onto printing. To explore this idea, I'll introduce this book. This is De Frey Harf, or The Free Harp, a collection of poetry by Bundist writers, including Morris Winchewski. Its cover, partial and worn as it is, tells us that this is a developed publication. In the front matter, we can see that it was printed by Vidoa i Bratia Rom, or The Widow and the Brothers Rom. The brothers here referring to Devorah's brothers-in-law, who apparently she did not get along with, though maybe that's something for another presentation. I'll just briefly explain, when this book was produced, the modern distinction between printing and publishing had already been established, meaning that the ROM printing press printed the work. In other words, the ROM press provided the technological means of production, which is itself a pretty salient point in the context of pre-revolutionary Russia. 
I believe it's also notable because of when it was printed, which was in the early days of De Velt, which would go on to become more prolific and relatively established in the following decade. At the time that this book was published, many other Bundist printing operations were almost ephemeral because of persecution by the government. And so De Velt, at this point, was a new vulnerable identity. Going back to the book, as I mentioned, this was printed after Devorah's death. And so here we can see that at that point, the point at which the press left the hands of the Ron family for good, her name was retained as its corporate identity, a clear indication of her clout. The front matter also tells us that this book is a stereotype edition created by the stereotype method of printing, which Devorah had been an early adopter of in Vilna of the 1880s during the production of the Talmud. Printing by stereotype meant that it was no longer necessary to set individual pieces of type and then have to do the same thing all over again in order to reprint later on. This resulted in a more affordable book and a shorter production time, which I think is a key point in light of the persecution that Buddhists faced in circulating their ideas. It seems that time would have been a luxury. Line of cut adornments, line of cut ornaments adorn the page, making the text more approachable and engaging and fingerprints throughout tell us that it's indeed a very well-read book. As much as this interested me, I, my curiosity was even more piqued when I found a later edition online thanks to the Yiddish Book Center in Massachusetts. It's nearly identical to the one we just looked at, except according to its front matter, it was printed in Warsaw in 1907. It seems to have been made from the stereotyping plates that were used in the Vilna edition. So this suggests the book was printed in Vilna at the Rom family press and was then reprinted in Poland, which would soon replace Vilna as the Bund's operating center. And from there, the book was more widely circulated. Going back to the idea of time as a luxury, it was interesting to look at both editions and compare characters, looking for differences and reflecting on them. I've included an example of this on the right hand side of the slide here. There's a clear difference. Where the Vilna edition is crisp, the Warsaw edition is not. It seems that the ink has pooled, which could well be a sign that the stereotyping plates weren't fully cleaned in between impressions, possibly indicating a rush, though the job was still possible, which may not have been the case if not for the stereotype plates. Given that Russia would soon become the Bund's operating center and given its goal of unifying Jews around Yiddish culture, I think these two editions are a tangible example of the means through which that culture was transmitted, as well as an example of how the Bund benefited from the unique stability and longevity of the widow Rom's printing press, a tangible part of her legacy, and that we can see her earlier investment in stereotyping technology facilitating the dissemination of this book. The Free Harp made me curious to know what other Bundist works might have been printed by the widow Ram. Though it was a little bit tricky to establish, this is partly because cataloging records for modern books such as this sometimes leave out details of the printer as opposed to the publisher. So I used WorldCat to see what other books in the Fishstein collection were printed in Vilna at the same time and looked to see if I could find the widow Ram. Lo and behold, I did. Volume one, number one of De Velt a literary journal and early offering from the publishing house of the same name. According to an American who visited Russia in the year it was printed, quote, the government exercises complete control over every printing office and type foundry throughout the entire empire. And neither of these establishments can be opened without first securing very special authorization, which each year is becoming more and more difficult to obtain. In light of this quote, we can imagine how shaky a start Develt must have had, and by extension, get an idea of how it benefited from the unique stability of the Rom family printing press. By looking more closely at how these works were produced, we can see that the kind of modern printing infrastructure established by Devorah Rom during the 1880s played a later part in the Bundist movement, meeting its goal of getting Yiddish literature to the masses. She is quite rightly well known for her contributions in connection with the printing of the Talmud. But what this detail also does is allow us to expand the scope of her legacy. And this leads me to ask broader questions about what connections Devorah might have had to the Bund, both direct and indirect. Members of her family were Bundist writers, but I wonder if she might have provided more technical training to other Bundists. I'm also curious about possible interactions between her and Boris Kletskin, the founder of De Velt, and whose own press took the mantle as Vilna's premier Yiddish printer and publisher once the ROM press started to go into decline. 
Given that printers are sometimes left out of cataloging records, it would be easy to miss the fact that these two works were printed by the widow and the brothers Rom. I'm grateful for the chance to illuminate this today, though, as I think it's a notable factor in how the Bund was able to get literature to the masses and it creates a bridge between Deborah Rom and the cultural landscape of Vilna following her death. I still have a lot of questions about the works I've shared today and much to learn about the Bund and their literary adventures and Deborah Rom's Deborah Rom herself. But again, I'm grateful to be starting this bibliographic journey, and I'm really looking forward to where it might lead me. Uh, thank you all very much, and I'll now hand back over to Chris. Thank you.